Amen. Amen. Turn your Bibles with me to John chapter 1. And we're going to continue in our series uh, looking at the success principles from the life of Christ. Success principles from the life of Christ. And just so that you don't, you, you're not distracted, let me just show you what my shirt says. Just so I know that you all be thinking. All right, all right. Okay. So, so far, we've looked at success principles that emulate from the life of Christ. And uh, we looked at purpose. We've looked at sacrifice. And we, last week, we looked at we looked at last week, come on, focus. And, and this week, we're going to deal with something that I've struggled over. And it really uh, challenged my own, my own theology. And we're going to talk about embodiment. And so let's just bow your heads one more time. I want to pray. Father, we pray again as we come. And we look at your words. May you bless us and be with us. Open up our minds to understand the depths of this revelation. That we can understand the truth of your words. And your word in Jesus name. Amen. So we're going to talk about embodiment. Now, one of the dangerous heresies, I would argue, that of the past that continues in our present time as, as well is the disembodiment of the Christian faith, the disembodiment of the Christian faith. And by disembodiment, I mean a Christian faith that exists only in the abstract, in the spiritual, in the ethereal. Now, because of the postmodern society, mechanistic and modern society that has become post-Christian, Increasingly, the Christian church and Christian theology is pushed out of the marketplace. It's pushed out of the material, uh, physical existence, and it's only allowed to exist in the places of abstraction, in the places of the philosophical and, and, the, and the theological, in the places of the ethereal, this un intangible. And as a Pentecostal, I know, and I am indeed one that uh, emphasized the moving of the Spirit. And it's important that we are cognizant of the invisible realms. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but principalities and power. But I also recognize that there is an innate danger that our faith can become purely spiritual. Our faith can become purely abstract and purely contemplative and when we are when we are in a physical world that is easy to have a faith that only exists in the immateriality of life I want somebody to track me today hallelujah but something tells me when I read the Bible I struggled over the fact that Jesus said this is my body that was broken for you I wondered why Jesus didn't say this is my philosophy that I'm giving to you this is my ideology that I want you to memorize this is my catechism that I want you to memorize but what Jesus gives us is something material something physical and so there is a kind of a, a materialization, a mechanism, a physicality, an embodiment of the Christian faith. That the Christian faith must exist in the cold, concrete realities of life. It must walk the streets when we see all kinds of things that conflict with what we believe. We must refuse the, 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 the pressure to retreat into an ideology, into philosophy. Hallelujah. Jesus said to the disciples, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you memorize the catechisms of the Son of God 
except you are able to write a dissertation on my Christology or my theology, and, and, and except you are able to know the philosophical implications of the cosmos, then you cannot be my disciples. What Jesus says in the midst of the speculation of who he is, in the midst of those who want to contemplate whether or not he is the Messiah, in the midst of the different theological and Christological um, explication of who Jesus is, in the midst of the, 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 the draw towards the abstract, Jesus says, unless you are able to eat the flesh and drink my blood. And I'm, I'm puzzled of this radical materiality of the Christian faith. That the Christian faith, when, it, when we look at what Jesus brings us, it's not like Buddha. It's, it's not just a, an, a philosophy. But there is something concrete and material about the Christian faith. And notice, Jesus did not say that you have to understand him philosophically. Now, what I want to argue today is that the, 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 the religion, the Christian faith of the first century was not a, just purely a philosophical and theological faith. It was a concrete, it was a material faith that included practical and included physical realities. Change, changes in people's lives weren't just ideological. Well, I used to be a Muslim, but now I'm a Christian. I couldn't tell the difference whether you're one or the other because your existence purely exists in your mind. Now, now when I look back at where did this idea come from? First of all, in the Old Testament, faith is embodied. The human body is not dichotomized or trichotomized into body, soul, and spirit. When you deal with the Old Testament, you are a person. And your mind, your spirit, and your heart, your body is all one. It was later with the Greek philosophical ideas that separated body, soul, and spirit. And later, Plato believed that the body and the soul and the spirit are, are, are separate entities. And so if you are a philosopher, you are not concerned with the mundane physicalities of this world. But you are concerned with the metaphysical and the contemplative of the eternal realm. And so the world of the philosopher is a philosopher is not concerned with the materiality, it's concerned with the philosophical and the abstract. It was this idea of dichotomizing the world between the physical and the spiritual, radical dichotomization that caused the church in the first century this idea of Gnosticism. This idea that the physical world is evil and the spiritual world is spiritual. And you see in 1 John, when they are, John is fighting against this idea that according to the Gnostics, that Jesus did not exist physically. He was a spirit. Jesus did not die physically because anything to do with God and divinity and eternally cannot be subjected to the world of materiality are you tracking me so far so what I'm saying to you today as I wrestle with this text the philosophers were were more concerned with the spiritual like many of us the Gnostics Christ was not a person but a spirit Christ did not actually die on the cross. The body is evil, an evil encasement where the spirit dwells. And this thinking gave rise to a Christianity that was more 
had more proclivity to asceticism, contemplation, meditation. We're not concerned with the practical discipleship and mission. We are moving to something far more deeper. Have you ever met deep people? Deep people. Deep people, they don't even go to church. Oh, no, 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 go to church. Far, that's far too material. You see, a postmodern world teaches, tells us that we have an 81% of people in America believe in God. But this number is radically reduced when you talk about Christ. Because they can deal with the abstraction of God. They can deal with the metaphysical reality of God. But that God became incarnate, material, flesh and blood. And God entered into the space of the world and make demands on people. No, that's the God who is too close. Too close. We want a distant God. And our world tells us that we can talk about God all day long. But when you begin to talk about the language of faith, that when faith is no longer just, just, just abstract, but it makes a demand upon you, you find that more and more people are less interested. But this is the mystery of Christianity. That God himself, and this is a radical change of the way we see the physical world. Because if God saw it necessary to become incarnate, that if God saw it necessary not to send an ideology, not to send an angel who would herald the philosophical and theological ways back to God, if God saw it necessary to become incarnate, then the Latin word is incarnate. That God was in Christ. If God became material, God be entered into the space of human existence. Now, if God has done that, we need to revisit the importance of the material world. Because while you are too spiritual to, to, to deal with the murkiness of flesh and blood, Christ, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. And it goes on to verse 14. And the Bible says, the word with, with God, and it says in verse 14, it says that Christ, pull up that verse for me on, on the screen. I want, to, want you to look at this very carefully. Hallelujah. And the word, verse 14, was made, became. The Latin there, we get the word incarnate. The word became, you see, the problem with many of us, we are able to deal with the abstract, but not the concrete. Hallelujah. But the word, in order to accomplish the redemption of the world, it was expedient for the heavenly realm, the, the spiritual being of God to take on materiality in order to accomplish. And the word tells us the word was made flesh. The word was made flesh. Flesh. You see, flesh is another thing. I can deal with the spirit. The spirit is clean. It doesn't give any trouble. You cannot see it. But flesh, flesh smells. Flesh is unpredictable. Flesh bleeds. Flesh is something that can get dirty, 
skin can become dirty. Fleshliness. And it's, flesh is difficult. I prefer to exist in the abstract realms of ideas because flesh is murky. But the Bible says the word became incarnated into the murkiness, the dirtiness, the unpredictable space of human existence. Now, if Jesus became enfleshed, that's what incarnate means. Jesus became enfleshed and he moved into the world. Why are we retreating from the world? Why are we retreating from the world into a world of the abstract where discipleship doesn't have bearing upon your everyday living? When people turn a blind eye when you live immorally because you can speak a good game. But if Jesus became flesh, we have to revisit our theology of the material world. Because God did not, as the Gnostics would argue, discard the world. God did not disband the world. But he entered into the world. Christianity must, and this is the idea of entering into the world, it's the idea of embodiment. God To redeem men and women. Had to embody. He had to take on the form. And enter it. And be up close. Not by remote control. Not by sending angelic agents. But God was in our face. And so this challenges then. Our own theology and even as a Pentecostal I want to challenge you to look again of your theology your ideas of embodiment and let me just say that when I say our faith must be embodied I mean embodiment possessing and acting through a physical manifestation embodiment the shift of a concept from abstract to concrete. The Christian faith must have a concrete impact upon the world. It must have a concrete impact upon our community. It must have a concrete impact on our families. So embodiment must involve the whole body. So when you're talking about how does embodiment affect us, whatever you do, if God has embodied human flesh, whatever we're going to do to be successful, there must be an embodying. Not just an idea, not just a theory, but whatever you're going to be, bring your old self into it. And what the incarnation bears down upon us is that God was completely committed. Incarnation. We must speak embodiment and embodiment of God in the world doesn't begin with Jesus. In Genesis chapter 1, we see God embodying the world. That God, as it were, speaks into the world and he is actually imposing himself upon the physical world. And when we see Jesus, God incarnate, it, so it challenges us then is that we cannot just say and sing songs like some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away. I'm running from this world. I'm running from this world. I'm running to Jesus. Why are you running from the world? When Jesus, God was in Christ, reconciling himself to the world. 
We have to resist this, this pressure to retreat into abstraction and recognize our faith must have concrete embodiment of our community. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Our, our embodied faith in the face of the catastrophic and the unthinkable. That when somebody is facing a, a, a catastrophe, an embodied faith does not retreat to a glib cliche. God knows all things. We will understand it better by and by. An embodied faith sits in the midst of the inconsistencies of life. Our embodied faith sits in the midst of the contradictions of the physical world and cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken us? An embodied faith engages the world with all its inconsistencies and all its contradictions. And it doesn't seek a quick excuse a simplistic theology, but it sits in the weight of the contradictions and the tensions of the world. And sometimes we sit in the tensions of the world and just by being, we have a faith that is just thinking, but not being, embodying the world. Our embodied faith must hear the footprints of Jesus on the concrete pavement of our congested streets. We must see the face of Jesus reflecting in the mirrors of the mall's shopping centers. And so firstly, my first point, as we, we revisit the implications of the incarnation, God being enfleshed, and what that tells us about our understanding of the physical world from God's perspective. Firstly, the incarnation of Christ rebukes our contemporary theology of the physical world. As I said, in the beginning was the word, and the word became enfleshed. The Latin is incarnate. The word became enfleshed. For, for the success of redemption, it was necessary, expedient for God to become enfleshed. When God chose to redeem humankind, he did not send an idea or thought, as I said, or philosophy, but he came. Fleshliness, as I said, it's is, is dealing with the inconsistencies, the murkiness of life. And sometimes Christians, we don't want to deal with the, the murkiness of life. People who are relapsing, people who never do what them, you, you tell them once and they don't do it. People who don't fall in line and people who can never learn. We, we want to deal with things that are straightforward. But in Christ, and this is the, the thing here, in Christ we see the embodied God. For the Bible says, for in him dwells the fullness of God bodily. If you didn't shudder, that means you missed it. In Christ. And it's not in Christ in his, all his glory. In the physical man in this world dwells he was the embodied personification of the almighty God. God in Christ on the streets of Jerusalem. To the point when Philip said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father and it will suffice us. And Jesus said to him, Philip, have I not been so long with you? I am the father that you are looking at 
the physical manifestation of the Father right here with you. So this idea of the materiality of God, the physicality of God is a game changer to the way we understand how faith works in the world. That you see, the Christian faith must be the presence of Christ, not just the philosophical and abstract and ecclesiological presence, but I mean the physical embodiment that when people ask, where is God? What does God look like? You don't need to give them a, a, a theological class, but they see it in you. Jesus said, I am the full expression of God Almighty. What does that tell us? That tells us then, infinite can embody the finite. It tells us that God can express himself in the fullness of the embodied Christ. Let me get ready to blow your mind with this. And if your mind is not blown, it's not my fault. <laughs> In you dwells the fullness, say fullness, of Christ. I don't mean in your theology. I don't mean in your confessions of faith. I don't mean in you as you worship. I'm talking about in your body. That when you walk, the fullness of Christ is walking in you. And this fullness is not just to interfere with the ethereal realm and the demons, but the fullness of the embodied Christ is to impact our environment. And me is a fullness of the embodied Christ. Now, if you caught 1% of that, it would transform your life. And me. I don't mean, oh, I'm saved, I'm some little bit. I am the full expression. In me is the full expression. Don't play with me now. Because you're playing with God in Christ in me. And in me doesn't mean I can have a wonderful revival. In me doesn't mean that I can sit back and think, oh Lord, I see you in heaven. Angels, I had a wonderful dream and I saw angels. In me means I'm going to get my kids out of drugs. I want to deal with my marriage. I want to deal with homelessness. I want to deal with brokenness. I want to deal with all the I want to deal with all the, the murkiness of life. Why? Because in me, I wonder why Jesus said, this is my body. After all the things he could have said. My body. What is the reason why the Eucharist and the Holy Communion is the center of Christianity? At the center of Christianity is not an ideology or theology. It's a body. Because God knew that we would have turned this religion, this faith into an abstract idea. So right at the center of Christianity is the fleshly broken body and the blood of Jesus Christ to always remind us that this faith is a material faith. That impact is lived, is worked out, not in the, 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 the flight into the alone, into the abstract, into the, by living in the material world. And that's why we see so many successful Christians spiritually. Spiritually successful. But living in the world as if you are Gnostic. 
You are agnostic because you believe that there is a dichotomy between the success of the spirit and the success of the world. God has called us for our faith to impact our community, our world. So what does that mean for us? Success means committing our body. What are you called to do? What are you called to do? Have you entered it fully? Are you flirting with it? Are you thinking about it? What is your purpose? Have you incarnated? Have you, have you considered the implication for your physicality, for your health, the implications for your, your mentality? The total commitment, bringing my whole body into the purpose where God has called me. Are you present in your body for the cause of God? Are you totally present in the reality? Some of you are not even present right now. Are you present? You see, this is what embodiment is. Whatever God calls me to do, I'm bringing everything in it. My whole being. I'm going to be committed to it. I'm bringing everything. I'm leaving nothing behind. That's what embodiment is all about. You see, embodiment is dealing with the daily nuts and bolts of the murkiness of being human. Not just a retreat to Sunday morning services, but being able to be present with the complexities and the inconsistencies of life. I'm bringing myself into it. The tough strategic decisions, ever-changing landscapes of this world. I'm orienting and I'm, I'm positioning myself to experiencing your, the purpose of God beyond just thinking. Embodied success is experiencing the gift being received that as you come as an embodied being, you recognize I am a gift to the world and the world is friendly towards me. I am a gift. I am present. I am being. Secondly, the church is the body, the embodiment of Christ in the world. He's the head of the body of Colossians 1.18. The church is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself may come to have first place in everything. The church is the embodied Christ in the world. The church is the living, breathing. I wonder why the Lord used the word body. Why are we the body of Christ? Not the mind of Christ. The essence of Christ, Lord, that's a pretty good. That's less. Body is a bit. Body, no, Lord, don't use that. His body gets old, frail, tired. Don't use that. Let's say the church is the. How about this one, Lord? The essence of Christ. The church is the spirit of Christ. We are the body of Christ. Why did he use body? You know why? That our faith must engage body. God doesn't want to. The church is not just the philosophy. Because philosophies can float and disappear. Bodies walk in the world. They heal and they touch. And Jesus said, I don't want you to be someone just floating around in the atmosphere like an angel. I want you to be a physical being touching real people, moving in the communities, bringing life, healing the sick, raising the dead. I want you to be engaged in the world because I came and I died for the world. And we must not retreat into a world of abstraction, but we must recognize that God has called us to be his. We are the body 
of Christ. Moving, talking, ministering, touching, seeing, hearing, loving in the reality of the world. I know many of us despair about the world, the, the sins in the world. The world's going to hell. The world is, is doing all kinds of wicked things and I'm tired of it. But it's the same world that Jesus hung on the cross for. And the church, write this down. The church is the continuous incarnation in fleshing of Christ in the world. We are continuously incarnating a Christ in us. We are continuously incarnating Christ into the world. Somebody give the Lord praise. Hallelujah. 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 Jesus took prayer and said, this is my body. Our faith must not be worked out in the flight from the world, but in the murkiness of the world. Being the body of Christ means allowing the models of incarnation to challenge us radically to an embodied faith, a faith that is practiced and worked out through our lived experience. An embodied faith must wrestle with the body of Christ and what does the body of Christ mean for our world today? What does it mean to the corpus Christi? You are the embodied presence of Christ. You are the embodied. What are you trying to do that you can't do by yourself? Say, I am the embodied presence of Christ in the world. And if that is true, then there is hope for the world. Because we are not going to retreat from the world and be outside commentators of a, about how it's going to hell. But I'm going to be engaged while there are others who are commenting of how things have gone back and things are not what they used to be. The moral fabric of society has gone to the dogs. And yes, all of that is true. But in the midst of all that, I am going to be the infleshed, the embodied presence of Christ, working with those who are homeless, working with those who are who are who are fighting against injustice speaking into a world. Why? Because the world is important to God. You may have given up on it and said goodbye world. I say no longer with you. You may have said goodbye but God has not said goodbye. World. God was in Christ. God was in Christ reconciling himself to the world. God was fighting for the world and the church, it's fleeing from the world. And lastly, the church is the embodiment of the kingdom of God. You. We are the bodily presence of Christ in the world. Jesus said, listen to this. If I by the theology of God cast out demons. If I buy the philosophy, the philosophy of God cast no. If I buy the finger of God, listen to this. This is good theology here. I buy is using the body imagery again, metaphor, the finger of God. Jesus said, if I, that means if I'm connected and the finger of God, this anthropomorphic language that God's finger is casting out demons, tells us that demons are not just these ethereal beings. 
demons also exist in, 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 in oppressive structures. Loan sharks that, that attack vulnerable people. Demons exist and principalities and powers are not just ghosts flying around. But they exist in real time as drug dealers. People giving fentanyl. These are the principalities and people turning their blind eyes and corrupting medicine and using all kind of pharmaceuticals, pharmaceuticals just to profit themselves. They are principalities and powers. You so busy fighting demons. This is coming from a Pentecostal that you cannot see the embodiment of evil, the manifestation of evil in the world. And so in closing, I want to say we're not just the embodiment of Christ. We are embodied and we are empowered. Luke 135 says, and the angel said, the Holy Spirit shall come upon you and the power of the Most High shall overshadow you. So Jesus, in his embodiment into the world, was baptized with the Spirit. Who? To have an embodied impact in the world, you need to be baptized with the power of God. And Acts 1 8. So when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one place. And Jesus said, You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You are the embodied empowerment person of Christ in the world embodied and empowered bow your heads hallelujah now I want to call you to join me I first of all repent that I've often reduced my faith down to confessions theologies and Bible readings and I've not connected my faith to the existential realities of life, friendship, pain, suffering. I've anesthetized myself from the pains of the world and the unpredictable things the world can throw at us. Lord, I repent and I come afresh. I re-enter the world as an embodiment of your presence. And I see the old anew through the lens of the embodied Christ. I speak Akatoshikai. Hallelujah. I want to make a commitment today and to say, Lord, I'm going to have and practice an embodied faith. And whether it's for my business, whether it's for my family, whether it's for my project, whatever it's for, I'm going to bring myself fully into it. I'm going to be the living embodiment of the crucified and resurrected Christ. I'm going to practice what I preach. I'm going to not just do, but I'm going to be be who you call me to be. I'm not just going to say, but I'm going to be. I'm going to make a commitment to Christ today that I'm moving into a sense of embodiment. And if you, those of you who want to join me, as I make a new commitment to Christ that I will be the conscious embodiment of the living Christ in the world. I'm going to invite you to come and stand with me. He shut up. Come and stand with me. As we say, Lord, we turn afresh to the world. 
Hallelujah. Come and stand with me. Come and stand with me. Hallelujah. Just give me five more minutes as we make a commitment that you're going to make a difference in your families. You're going to make a difference in your workplace. You're going to be the embodiment of Christ in your workplace. You're going to make a difference with the things that you are planning to do because you're going to do it because you are embodied and empowered by Christ. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Jesus. Lift up your hands. Hallelujah. Be present. Be conscious of your hands. Be conscious of your feet standing. Be conscious of your breath breathing. Be 100% present and say, Lord, here I am. Christ became incarnate and dwelt. He was tabernacled among us. You right now, lift up your voices. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus tonight, today, this morning, we come, we repent that God, we are often have fled from the world. We've relegated the world to the place of the devil, where the devil runs rampant. But we recognize that we are the embodied agents of change in the world. And God, we pray for forgiveness and for the renewing of our faith as an embodied faith a faith filled with power, a faith which understands the implications of being indwelt by the power and the person of Christ. That we are filled with your power. And this power is not just abstract. It reigns in us. It lives in our physical temple. And we are the the temple of God. Hallelujah. And so God, we praise you today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you're here today and you're not, you don't know Jesus, you say, I want Jesus to be embodied in me. I want you to come now. Come and join us. We want to pray with you. Is there anybody here? Repeat after me, Heavenly Father, I thank you that Jesus was enfleshed in the world. He was incarnate. He was embodied. And I pray today that I will incarnate with my full body and my full soul into the purpose that you've called me I recognize I am filled with your power I am filled with your purpose and I'm filled with your anointing and I will come on I said I will impact my environment impact my families impact my workmates impact my friends and impact my community in a physical way in Jesus name come on give the Lord worship right now hallelujah 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 come on worship the Lord come on worship him right now Lift him up in this place right now. Come on, lift up the Lord. Give him praise right now. Give him praise and glory. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. God was in Christ. Lord, we say yes to you. Yes to you, Jesus. Yes to you, God.
Jesus. May God bless you. Go back to your seats. On Thursday, we're going to be talking more about how we can be the embodied presence of God to impact our environment. So come along on Thursday night at 7 o'clock, overflow, and join us. God bless you this this morning. Don't just run away. Meet a friend. Say hi to someone. God bless you and see you next week. Thank you.